So next, we're going to hear from five National Geographic explorers who are each carrying on this incredible legacy. Each of them have three minutes to share their update from the field on their current projects. First up, underwater archaeologist and National Geographic explorer, Guillermo de Anda. Welcome. this journey through one of my offices. I am uh, an underwater archaeologist, and I work in one of the most amazing places in the world, probably the last uh, wild place in Mexico on the underground. Uh, but you know these are very vulnerable aquifers, as all the aquifers in the world, because nobody can see them. So one of our missions is trace and map the amazing geography of the invisible and see what is going on there. If uh, there is a little bit of uh, insecticides or fertilizers there, uh, everything is going to get ruined. And we are looking at some effects of that in the coast. This terrifying picture is a living island, or seaweed sargasso, that increased its size, and it's probably causing a social problem in Mexico because of some of the pollutants coming out of the aquifer are on the shore, and they grow. Uh, in, in, in a out of proportion. So uh, something similar happened some thousand years ago, another catastrophe caused by climate change, which is now very familiar for us. And uh, we came across a year ago, looking for a connection on an underwater flooded cave to uh, this amazing cave, which is no other than the representation of the desperation of the Maya. It's a very hard place to explore, and uh, we could make it just because we were looking for the water once again. The same as the ancient Maya did, and they place this treasure. They place this treasure of information in this cave, uh, doing an amazing effort, maybe because they're desperate for water. So this is what uh, they bring in these big incense burners. There's almost 200 of them inside this cave. I cannot imagine how they managed to place them there. And all this is uh, something very interesting uh, offered to the central Mexico Maya god, Tlaloc. What is a foreign god doing in the heart of the Mayan area? This god, He's been guarding this cave for over a thousand years, we can tell. This is a treasure of information. There's a lot of things that we can discover with modern archaeological techniques. But uh, thankfully, we are not alone. We have National Geographic supporting this project. And I'm sure we will discover much more things about why the Maya collapsed in this time, what happened in Chichen Itza, who were the people that placed these offerings there? Thank you very much for support archaeology in National Geographic. It's in, of course, National Geographic's DNA. And uh, I'm very pleased and thankful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Memo. Next, we have a person I met at the bar yesterday, ecologist, conservationist, and National Geographic explorer, Paula Kahumbu. Welcome. Morning, everyone. <clears throat> I come from a land of greatness. Uh, Africa's unique megafauna is uh, a treasure for the whole world. And we're so blessed to have it. But it's under so much threat as well. It's not just climate change. It's not just the extinction crisis that we're experiencing. It's because Africa's wildlife doesn't have an African constituency to protect it. The animals and the places that they live in I did my PhD on elephants. These are the most amazing animals. Anybody from the US and Europe knows and loves these animals because of Nat Geo, BBC, Disney, Nature, all these great documentaries. But these animals are like us. They're like human beings. And we're very close to them in Africa. Our, our peoples believe that elephants are practically humans. We can relate to them. This is Kamkwat. She's a matriarch of an incredible family. Uh, just behind her is her, sister, her daughter. Quay, and beneath her is Q-tip. The day after, this photograph was taken of this extraordinary, calm, peaceful, and trusting family. Oh. 
Kumquat and her entire family were gunned down because of the demand for ivory half a world away, where people wanted to wear ivory trinkets. This incident made us furious. We launched a campaign called Hands Off Our Elephants to fight the ivory trade. It was so successful because we mobilized public support in Kenya. We got every Kenyan to know that elephants needed their help. The government changed the laws. But it's not just elephants. All our animals are in trouble because the narrative that our people have in Africa is that animals are not friendly. Animals are your enemies. They kill you. So animals and people are always in tense relationships and animals are being killed. This is the story that children are, are getting. This is their only narrative about wildlife. We've got to change that. So we're looking for those heroes like Richard Torreira, a young man who invented a flashing light system to keep lions out of his father's homestead. He didn't just save cattle, he's saving lions because there's no more conflict. This young man is a superhero. He is the role model that thousands of children across Africa are looking at. So we're telling their stories through a movement called Wildlife Warriors. And I'm standing here representing this incredible movement of young Africans. We're starting in Kenya. And what we're doing is making documentaries about these amazing people. This is Fakiri Kiponda, gave up a career as an accountant to save turtles because when he was a child, he stumbled on a nest of turtles running down to the beach. Our crew is African. We're telling African stories, taking these into classrooms and taking children out of classrooms and into the national parks. And we're mobilizing a group of young people to be part of this movement, taking children to the national parks. We're getting people onto the streets en masse to demand action from our government. Last month, we managed to get 4,000 people to march in the streets of Nairobi. And the next day, we asked for the park to be open for free for Kenyans. 17,000 people showed up. The, the Wildlife Service was overwhelmed. Wildlife Direct is lighting a fire and igniting a movement across Africa to connect people to wildlife so that they treasure it and fight to save it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Paula is our only terrest terrestrial speaker. Uh, we're trying to maintain the balance of you know, earth and water. So our next speaker is a conservation biologist and National Geographic explorer, Archana Anand. Welcome. Over 8 million tons of marine litter reach the global oceans every year. Just 10 rivers carry 92% of all the marine litter to these oceans. Eight of these rivers are in Asia, some in the country I was born in, India, and some in the country I now live in, China. Everyone is talking about plastic, but what about sewage? Do you know what happens to water that you flush when you use the bathroom? Over 90% of all the world's sewage that gets dumped into the ocean is completely untreated. Sewage is rich in nutrients that some plants and animals love and grow rapidly. They respire rapidly and they deplete oxygen required for all life. This often results in ocean life literally gasping for breath. I grew up in Madras in India watching the Bay of Bengal fall from grace as one of the most pristine oceans to one that is very polluted today. Not too far from there are the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, home to over 500 species of coral, several endemic, and six aboriginal human tribes. They are a cornucopia of life on this planet. Yet, they remain scientifically unexplored. Today, these islands see over one million tourists every year. And this has resulted in an enormous increase in the sewage dumped into the sea. So we have two problems. The first is we do not know what lives in the ocean. The second is we do not know how ocean life is changing with increasing pollution. Some of the most important creatures in the ocean are those that are invisible to the naked eye, yet are valuable markers of ocean health. 
In collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution, I deploy structures that resemble mini condominiums on the ocean floor. These blocks are about nine inch by nine inch in dimension and have tiny spaces for animals to crawl, hide or settle into. After one year, I collect and identify everything that has colonized these plates using photography and their DNA. Cataloging these invisible creatures and documenting how their populations change with pollution gradients can give us scientific evidence to shed the spotlight on how we are degrading our coastal ecosystems and how we can mitigate threats in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Next, we have marine biologist, National Geographic explorer, and whale poop girl, Asha DeVos. Welcome. About a decade ago, I fell in love with the largest animal that has ever roamed the planet. A filter feeder by nature with a tall, powerful, vertical blow and a comically small dorsal fin attached to a never-ending back. <laughs> the day I first set eyes on these blue whales off the southern coast of Sri Lanka, I was actually on the lookout for a different species. Sperm whales with their left tilted blow, wrinkly skin, and penchant for squid. I'd already spent some time with these animals when I'd eavesdropped on their secret lives by listening to their calls. And I was so fascinated that I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life studying them. But that was until I had this chance encounter with an aggregation of blue whales that showed me we had so much left to learn about the giants of our planet. But I promised myself I would return to my toothy friends, and my opportunity came knocking a couple of months ago. I headed off to the no northwest coast of Sri Lanka with an incredibly experienced and capable team. And over the course of the next week, my mind was blown. Obviously, I knew that sperm whales were amazing animals, so there was no doubt in that. But as someone who'd spent 10 years studying blue whales, I realized I was in the unique position to compare and contrast these two species in this shared environment, the largest baleen whale and the largest toothed whale. And I was also rem reminded what an amazing part of the world I come from. So come with me to Sri Lanka, where blue whales aggregate to feed, but otherwise lead largely solitary lives. But sperm whales, they come together in these vast maternal groups. And they keep these maternal groups together by using communication, particularly pattern series of clicks called codas that they use to keep their groups together and tightly close. But blue whales, well, they don't vocalize quite so much. But when they do, they do so in low rumbles that resemble jet engines. And blue whales will dive to hundreds of meters deep to feed on huge gulpfuls of tiny shrimp. But sperm whales, they dive to thousands of meters deep. And they've adapted to do so remarkably by basically they fold their rib cages squish their lungs so they'd reduce those air pockets. And just before the dive, they exhale 90% of the air in their lungs. And off they go into these deep, dark places where they encounter giant squid. Maybe they even battle with this squid. But that's not the point. The point is they are feeding on things that can often be many times their size. A sharing platter rather than an individual meal. Unfortunately, these two species, their populations, have been decimated in the past by whaling. And today, their recovery is hindered by things like ship strike, no noise, uh, noise pollution, entanglement, harassment by whale watching boats, and also people trying to swim with them. These are things that I'm trying to work on right now. But my point is this. If these two species, the giants of our oceans, have learned to live in harmony with one another in this shared space, a watery world with no defined boundaries, 
Isn't it time that we learned to do the same? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Our final speaker for the day is someone I've looked up to all my life. And it's an honor to be welcoming onto the stage photographer, National Geographic fellow, Brian Scarry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good morning. Culture is important. Family, food, friends, music, all very important to whales. Humpback whale moms whisper to their babies. Sperm whales celebrate their identity through dialect. And orca these days are getting takeout food from commercial fishing boats. My latest project is focused on whale culture. And I believe through that lens of culture, we can begin to see the ocean in a new way, a place where tradition and family matter. They matter tremendously. Here's a brief look at some of the visuals that I've done so far. Thank you very much.